continue to target the transportation sector and would like nothing better than to take a plane out of the sky. Every member of this committee appreciates the need to protect against that threat. This committee is focused on ensuring that TSA continues to mature into an effective, professionalized agency that fulfills its security mission in a manner that does not allow unlawful profiling or discrimination. The report GAO is releasing today shows that TSA's current operations do not meet the mark. GAO found that TSA has anti-profiling policies in place for its behavioral detection program, yet lacks an oversight mechanism to ensure anti-profiling policies are actually followed. Given the concerns this committee and others have voiced for more than a decade regarding TSA's behavior detection program and the door it opens to unlawful profiling, it is unconscionable that TSA has not developed better oversight procedures. JO's new report follows a 2013 report that recommended that Congress limit future funding for TSA's behavior detection activities. It also follows GAO's 2017 finding that TSA lacks valid scientific evidence to support nearly 80% of the behaviors it relies upon to identify suspicious travelers for additional screening. Meanwhile, TSA has not provided sufficient evidence of the security benefits of behavior detection. TSA has scaled back the scope of its behavior detection program, but the logical conclusion for years of evidence is clear. It is time to end the program entirely. For today's report, GAO also looked at 3,700 complaints related to civil rights and civil liberties filed against the agency over two and a half years and found over 1,000 complaints with potential indicators of discrimination. These complaints allege a variety of discriminatory incidents and practices encompassing all of TSA's screening operation. DHS response to GAO's finding shows the department does not understand the gravity of the allegation it faces. DHS stated it was pleased to note that GAO identifies only 3,700 complaints related to passenger screening alleging civil rights and civil liberties violations during the relevant time period. DHS has missed the point entirely. First, 3,700 is not an insignificant number. A single incident where a traveler feels traumatized as a result of allegedly discriminatory treatment is certainly not insignificant to that person and should not be considered insignificant to anyone. Under my leadership, this committee will not ignore or downplay the significance of any American making a creditable allegation of discrimination by their government. As TSA says, not on our watch. Moreover, incidents are likely unreported as people who are discriminated against in various ways throughout society may not have the time or resources to lodge formal complaints in every instance. It is clear from the complaints GAO has documented in recent media reports that TSA's screening processes disproportionately impact minority populations. In particular, advanced imaging technology or AIT machines regularly alarm on certain populations such as Sikh passengers, African-American women, and transgender people leading to increased delays and pat-downs. AIT machines rely on algorithms that define what TSA considers normal and religious headwear, hairstyles, or bodies that fall outside that definition are flagged for further inspection. TSA must improve its technology to address this issue while considering the diversity of the public when it solicits and tests new technology. Finally, I want to make clear my concerns are not with the TSA workforce. TSA's frontline officers have proven their commitment to TSA's mission despite insufficient pay and during the government shutdown, missed paychecks. Over and over again, 
TSA has made the news due to a poor passenger screening experience, and after an investigation, TSA's statement has almost always noted that officers followed security protocols appropriately. By and large, TSA's problems lie with its procedures, not its officers. As for the agency, I commend TSA for the work it has done to engage advocacy group and prove cultural awareness training for officers. The next step is for TSA to ensure it fully considers concerns voiced by multicultural groups when developing technologies and screening procedures. TSA must provide effective security without disproportionately impacting certain groups of Americans. This is not either or proposition. TSA interacts more intimately with the public on a regular basis than any other government agency, screening over two million passengers every day and physically touching many of them. For many, TSA is not just the public face of government, but its hands too. Its success as a security agency depends upon the trust and compliance of a diverse public. I hope to have a productive dialogue today about how we can continue to move TSA toward that important goal. I thank the members for joining us and look forward to our discussion. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, a gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers, for an opening statement. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, allegations of unlawful profiling are nothing new for TSA. Since the agency was created after 9-11, it has faced allegations that its screening practices unfairly target certain populations of travelers. Some of these allegations have stemmed from TSA's behavior detection program. Throughout the program's several iterations, the TSA has faced bipartisan criticism from this committee for its lack of scientific validation in evaluating passengers' risks to the aviation security. That is why I'm pleased that last Congress, the Republican majority enacted a legislation Representative Katko authored to end standalone behavior detection officer pro positions and require them to be integrated into the primary screening functions at checkpoints. This important step has helped alleviate passenger wait times while sending a strong message to TSA about Congress's dissatisfaction with the behavioral detection, detection program. In the most recent uh, review, GAO issued a single recommendation for TSA to establish an oversight mechanism to better monitor behavior detection activities. TSA should implement, implement this recommendation immediately. I would note that during the four-year period of uh, GAO considered as a part of this report, TSA conducted nearly three billion passenger screenings. Of those three billion, only 1,066 passengers had allegations of unlawful profiling that were substantiated and resulted in employee uh, retraining. That's an average of one substantiated allegation for every 2.8 million passengers screened. In no way does this minimize the very real experiences of those who have faced discrimination. Even one incident is too many. However, this context is important. The vast majority of TSA officers conduct themselves professionally. It would be unfortunate for this committee to send a message to them or the traveling public that unlawful profiling is rampant within the ranks when, according to this data, it is not. In contrast to the low uh, rates of unlawful profiling, previous media reports have highlighted the very uh, high rates of TSA screeners failing to detect threats at checkpoints. I hope that at some point in the near future, the majority will focus on oversight efforts on finding a solution to this tremendous risk to aviation security. Finally, this is uh, the second hearing uh, concerning TSA in as many weeks where the majority chose not to invite the agency to testify. I think all members would agree that it would, be, would have been beneficial for the TSA to appear today to respond to the GS, GAO report and the perspectives of other witnesses. At some point, I hope the majority will seek input from TSA on these important issues. In the interim, I look forward to this hearing and from our witnesses today. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, <coughs> other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Uh, also, uh, we had informed the minority uh, weeks ago that we intended to hold this hearing uh, today and formal notice of the hearing was made in full compliance with the rules. Uh, we too would have wanted TSA to be here. Uh, the committee has been engaged with TSA and other stakeholders and this is just part of what we have to do to look at this situation. So we look forward to getting TSA uh, before the committee at some point. I'd also like to welcome our panel of witnesses uh, 
today. Our first witness, Mr. William Russell, is an acting director of the Government Accountability Office, Homeland Security and Justice Team, where he's responsible for leading GAO's work on aviation and transportation security. Mr. Russell has over 17 years of experience at GAO and was previously an assistant director in GAO's contracting and national security acquisition team. Mr. Sim Singh is the senior manager of policy and advocacy at the Sikh Coalition, where he works on national advocacy issues against hate crime, school bullying, employer discrimination, and racial profiling. Prior to joining the Sikh Coalition, Mr. Singh developed apps that provide free legal resources for highly vulnerable communities and worked in governmental affairs through prior positions at Facebook and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Janie Nelson is Associate Director Counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund Incorporated, where she, he, she helped oversee the operation of LDF's program. Prior to joining LDF in June 2014, Ms. Nelson held senior leadership positions at St. John University School of Law, where she also was a full professor of law. Without objection, the witness's full statement will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize here so her statement for five minutes, beginning with Mr. Russell. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Rogers, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss perspectives on TSA's policies to prevent unlawful profiling while screening passengers. In our report issued today, we examined a range of issues related to how TSA implements policies that prohibit unlawful profiling to include oversight of behavior detection activities, as well as how TSA addressed passenger screening related complaints that allege profiling and other civil rights and civil liberty issues. The bottom line is that TSA has policies and procedures in place that prohibit unlawful profiling of passengers, but can improve oversight of its behavior detection activities related to profiling. Second, Based on our review of passenger screening related complaints, TSA found indications of potential discrimination and unprofessional conduct by screeners that involved race or other factors for more than 1,000 of the complaints reviewed. In terms of behavior detection oversight, TSA began using behavior detection in a more limited way in 2016 to identify potentially high risk passengers who exhibit certain behaviors it asserts are indicative of stress fear or deception and refer them for additional screening. We found that TSA has oversight policies for behavior detection that do prohibit unlawful profiling, but does not specifically assess whether profiling occurs. For example, TSA's optimized behavior detection handbook and oversight guidance require supervisors to conduct routine checks on behavior detection operations to monitor compliance with standard operating procedures. This includes seven specific assessments and checklists for managers to document completion of routine oversight. However, our review of the checklist found that they do not specifically instruct supervisors to monitor for compliance with procedures intended to prohibit unlawful profiling. We recommended that TSA develop a specific oversight mechanism to address compliance in this regard. TSA agreed to do so and plans to implement this recommendation by the end of September 2019. Second, apart from behavior detection, we also examined civil rights and civil liberty related passenger screening complaints received by TSA from October 2015 through February 2018 and looked at what TSA did to address those complaints. In total, TSA received about 3,700 of these types of complaints, the majority of which alleged discrimination or profiling based on personal attributes and characteristics a number of specific complaints related to hair and transgender issues. TSA's multicultural branch, the office responsible for reviewing these types of complaints, assessed over 2,000 of them, and for about half, 1,066 to be exact, found indications of potential discrimination and unprofessional conduct that involved race or other factors. For example, in one case we reviewed, a passenger alleged profiling based on headwear TSA officials used camera recordings and statements from officers involved in the encounter to substantiate that screening procedures and violations had occurred. 
In response to these complaints, TSA recommended a range of refresher training across airports or for screeners at individual airports identified in the complaints. We found that TSA's responses to the complainants included, but were not limited to, apologizing for the screening experience or informing the complainant about next steps, such as agency plans to address the complaint or the underlying conduct that gave rise to it. We also found that TSA reviewed trends in the passenger complaint data and used that information to further inform and update screener training. In conclusion, TSA can improve how it conducts oversight of behavior detection activities related to profiling and should continue efforts to identify and address passenger screening complaints that allege civil rights and civil liberty issues. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Rogers, this concludes my prepared remarks. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I now recognize Mr. Singh to summarize his statement for five minutes. I'd like to thank this committee, including Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Rogers, for their leadership and the opportunity to appear here today. My name is Sim J. Singh, and I am the Senior Manager of Advocacy and Policy at the SIC Coalition, the nation's largest Ameri SIC American civil rights organization. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit focused on combating and preventing hate in America. We recognize the importance of TSA's mission to protect this nation's transportation systems to ensure freedom of movement for people and commerce. However, if that is TSA's mandate, they must ensure the freedom of movement for all people, regardless of their race, sex, gender identity, national origin, religion, and disability. In 2019, we continue to receive complaints from sick travelers across the nation, reporting troubling incidents of profiling and discrimination. Oftentimes, these incidents involve secondary screening demands without any TSA technology indicating there is a problem. These discriminatory actions, combined with a lack of clear traveler guidance, has led to sick passengers feeling frustrated and singled out because they experience inconsistent TSA security screenings between airports and even within specific airports of frequent travel. While TSA's increased reliance on technology has come with government assurances that it would mitigate against the need for pat-downs and searches that violate basic civil rights, this has not solved the discriminatory and invasive screening practices that enable the profiling of six. As a sick American and frequent traveler who maintains my religious articles of faith, I almost always experience an AIT alarm indicating that my turban is a problem and that I must undergo additional screening ordinarily by explosive trace detection. A device that we receive many complaints about for false alarms, usually because the TSO failed to change our gloves and or the ETD swab. Additional screening and searches for observant six remains highly probable. Reinforcing that current TSA technology, policies and procedures continue to single out and target our community. The message at airports across the country to millions of passengers watching, six are outsiders that somehow pose threats worthy of investigating, regardless of how pretextual that investigation is. These discriminatory practices continue to shift the focus away from the TSA's top priority of protecting our nation. The Office of the Inspector General has repeatedly documented threats such as guns, knives, and explosives breezing through TSA security checkpoints with ease. As TSA continues to disproportionately focus on discriminatory behaviors like sick religious articles of faith, it takes away from the necessary focus of combating credible threats. Unlike most Americans, Sikhs are continually asked to pay a price for exercising our constitutional rights by submitting to routine and frequent searches by TSA. It further perpetuates negative stereotypes and falsely validates the myth of racial and religious communities posing a threat to our country. TSOs and other passengers witnessing minorities disproportionately receiving these additional screenings leads to the creation of implicit and explicit biases that detrimentally influence security policies and behavior which justify scrutinizing specific kinds of travelers on racial or religious grounds. That begs the question, are we really going to always select a sick for additional screening because he or she wears a turban? And more importantly, why is this treatment considered acceptable? 
We request members of this committee and Congress to reintroduce and pass the End Racial Profiling Act to comprehensively address bias and limit the harmful impacts of algorithmic bias. Second, our government must correct screening policies and procedures that enable profiling, such as TSO abuses of discretion that is often used as pretext to profile. Third, any new technology or procedures must reduce the use of pat-downs and ensure that travelers aren't singled out based on their race, religion, or gender. These invasive TSO-administered pat-downs should be an absolute last resort where other screening procedures cannot resolve an alarm. Lastly, Congress should mandate independent and regular civil liberties impact assessments and require data collection on secondary screening incidents by the TSA. It is our sincere hope that this committee and TSA address the need for profiling protections and eliminate discriminatory practices, not just for the religiously observant Sikhs and Muslims, but also for the disability, transgender, and other minority communities. It is not a coincidence that the American public continues to fear and discriminate against those whom our government continues to discriminate against. When a turban Sikh is routinely subjected to secondary screenings without cause, it further validates every false stereotype that contributes to Sikhs remaining hundreds of times more likely to experience bias, bigotry, or backlash in America. We're deeply appreciative for the time given today for the Sikh American community to raise our concerns. Thank you for your testimony. I now recognize Ms. Nelson to summarize her statement for five minutes. Defense and Educational Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. LDF is the nation's oldest civil and human rights law organization. LDF was founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, and in the 80 years since its inception, it has used legal advocacy strategies to promote the full, equal, and active citizenship of black Americans. That includes litigating the seminal case of Brown versus Board of Education and Newman versus Piggy Park Enterprises, which is important for our purposes here today because it upheld Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 1964's prohibition on racial discrimination in public accommodations. For as long as we have been in this country, black people have faced discrimination that impedes our mobility in public spaces and discrimination in various spheres because of our hair. Indeed, the civil rights movement that ended legal apartheid in the United States was anchored in acts of resistance related to transportation, including the bravery of women like Rosa Parks and children like Claudette Colvin. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was built on the foundation that Congress can take action to prohibit racial discrimination that impedes travel and thereby impedes interstate commerce. Black women's hair has also never ceased to be policed. From forcible head coverings in the antebellum South to the present day denial of employment and other rights based on our hair texture and treatment. In light of this history, we at LDF are deeply troubled that TSA's full body scanners disproportionately single out black women for additional and burdensome security procedures, including invasive and humiliating hair pat downs. This systematic infringement on the mobility of black women by a government agency must be corrected, and we are heartened that this committee is taking up the charge. Roughly 8% of the U.S. adult population of flyers is black, 17% is Latinx, and 6% is Asian. However, reports suggest that countless black travelers have experienced heightened suspicion and profiling as a result of TSA technology that singles out black people in airports, particularly black women, simply because the technology is unable to distinguish contraband from natural black hair. The false positives produced by TSA's full body scanners exemplify the impact of purportedly race neutral technology that nonetheless perpetuates racial profiling. Whether they are high profile celebrities, business travelers, or general commuters, for black women, TSA scanners are one more assault in a constant barrage of risk assessments to which they are subjected on a daily basis and which reflect deep-rooted biases and historical associations between race and dangerousness. 
Moreover, racial discrimination is a proven threat to our national security. Yet TSA has not justified that its highly criticized practice of violative hair pat downs improve security. To the contrary, security experts have called into question whether these additional screenings are an effective use of TSA personnel's time and resources. Most disturbing, perhaps, is that top TSA officials do not seem to recognize that a system that disproportionately singles out black women is discriminatory. We know that technology is susceptible to biases of the humans who create it. This means that technology that uses white phenotype as a default can easily produce biased outcomes against people of color. And this issue is not new. Not only did this committee hold a hearing on these issues a little over a year ago, TSA has been aware of discriminatory and biased security practices for years. In 2015, it entered a settlement agreement over the very issue of racially profiling black hair. To be very clear, we recognize and respect TSA's important security functions at our nation's airports. However, I wanna stress that we can maintain security in our nation's airports while maintaining the human dignity of our nation's travelers. We can pursue new technology and not compromise civil and human rights. In fact, these goals can not only coexist, by law, they must. In closing, we acknowledge TSA's important charge to ensure safe travel while meeting its obligation to treat all passengers with dignity. We also appreciate the attention this committee has paid to this important issue, and thank you for your consideration and for the opportunity to testify today. I thank the witnesses for that testimony, uh, and I remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel. I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, let me say from the outset that I think it's clear that every member of this committee wants to get it right. Uh, the traveling public has a, a, a duty uh, to be safe, uh, and we have an obligation to make sure that that process by which they get screened is the best system. Our challenge, uh, and I'm speaking for the chair, is I've had experiences uh, as an African American that uh, perhaps some of my other colleagues haven't when I've had to question why am I being put in secondary screening? And it was always not real clear as to why. And I hear comments quite often. So one of the reasons we're trying to uh, have this hearing is to get it right. Uh, how can we reduce those numbers down uh, as low as possible? Uh, we have invested in technology. We're continuing to invest in technology. And uh, we've done away with some of the uses, behavioral detection uh, officers and other things that didn't have real science behind them. But we still had to work at getting it right because a lot of these instances are still occurring. Uh, one of the things I'd like to ask Mr. Russell is, uh, is there a clear uh, traveler's redress uh, available to someone who feel uh, that he or she has been uh, singled out for discrimination? So what we found in our uh, most recent report was that there are three main ways to do that. And basically you're gonna contact the TSA contact center, which hand handles all the complaints. Uh, but you could do that via phone, email or electronic communication, and then there are comment cards at uh, airports that you can fill out as well. So those are the three main avenues, and you have uh, 180 days after the experience to, to lodge that complaint with TSA. So is, to your knowledge, were you able to ascertain whether or not individuals who are going through that process are told that? So there are officials at, at the airports that can help uh, customer, customer service representatives that can help uh, steer passengers in the right place if, if they know to find them, is, is how we uh, talked about it in the report. Ms. Singh, your experience on uh, uh, the group you are here representing, has that process been clear to those individuals? It's not really been clear for individuals. And in fact, I would say that the word 
comment cards is a deceptive practice. It doesn't really indicate that this is a complaint form for a traveler to use. Um, secondly, travelers who are already delayed and frustrated with the secondary screening procedures have flights to catch. They're not gonna try to hang around at the airport to try to ascertain who the appropriate individual is to complain. Um, and so we developed the Fly Rights app to helpfully make it a little bit more accessible. Um, we launched this app in 2012 so that complaints could be officially made through our app and forwarded to TSA. Um, you know, TSA has done a little bit more in terms of the online space, allowing for complaints. But I think people are tired of complaining for 18 years and seeing little to no change. Uh, the inconsistent application of security procedures and discretion at airports makes the job too big of a problem to always complain about. And the entire system really requires an overhaul as a top-down messaging is not effectively implemented by airports and security officials that kind of govern themselves. Uh, the more sophisticated technology, such as AIT, is also often perceived as superior to human expertise, and people are left to um, make a generalized complaint about the machine, not necessarily about the TSO or a specific airport, um, and they may not even understand that the technology they're using is a problem for them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Nelson, what's been uh, your experience with people making complaints? Well, my experience has been that, as, as uh, my co-panelists have described, the process is not clear. It leaves a lot to be desired. Currently, if a complaint is lodged and supplemental information is requested and it is not provided within a 10-day window, the administrative complaint is closed. So the 3,700 complaints that were identified in the GAO reports really does not represent the lion's share of incidences that happen at airports that go unreported and ultimately are later dismissed because they are not fully complete. One of the five recommendations that the Legal Defense Fund is making is that the complaint process be overhauled, that there is greater public education and ad campaigns about the ability to lodge such complaints. And when passengers complain to TSOs and complain to airport security personnel, they should be immediately offered an opportunity to file a complaint then or to later do so online. Thank you very much. I yield to the ranking member. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, would tell uh, Mr. Singh and Ms. Uh, Nelson that uh, the IT machines, I have been a long-time critic of, those, of that technology and have worked for years to make sure we don't purchase any more of them. Uh, I think they need to be out of our airports uh, as soon as we can replace them with a better technology. Uh, but Mr. Russell, uh, TSA has struggled uh, for a long time with uh, screening in a way that treats everybody fairly. Uh, but they seem to have been hung up on this be behavior detection uh, approach even though we've at, told them to stop using it. Why do you think that they continue to lean on this uh, approach to screening along with using the AIT when there are better technologies available? What they've reported to us is that they just consider behavior detection as one layer of security among many. You know, you have secure flight, the technology at the checkpoint, um, and that that's a useful security measure to help uh, counter threats to aviation. What we've said in our past report is that um, there was little valid evidence to support a good number of the indicators that are in use and had recommended that they limit funding uh, until such time that they get that, um, that valid support. And I, as was mentioned, the um, Aviation Security Act of 2016 helped uh, TSA in the standalone behavior detection program and now those uh, staff trained in that function have been converted to uh, regular se transportation security officers. But, but don't you find that they still use that uh, approach in their screening practices, even though they've been told to move on to a different uh, job? Right, what we found is they're still being used in a limited way uh, in support of passenger screening canine teams, as well as uh, vetting of, of airport workers as they come uh, to work every day. One of the arguments for using a, a federalized screening personnel as opposed to allowing airports to privatize uh, the screening personnel, let them just be supervised by TSA, is that it's supposedly supposed to offer more consistency in the way screening is done. Have you found that to be true? It the, seems uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies to me. Right, that wasn't something we looked at at this review, the, that comparison between the um, 
the SPP airports and, and a federalized TSA airport. Uh, Mr. Singh, I heard you mention a few minutes ago that you had seen some improvements in TSA, not, not enough, but some improvements. Ms. Nelson, is that your view? That there have been some improvements to TSA? Well, we just mentioned that there's a diminished use of behavioral techniques, and that is certainly an improvement, but we still have a very long way to go. There are very uh, uh, sound practices that can also keep us safe, and we do not believe, as, as, as the chairman emphasized in his opening remarks, that it is an either-or uh, equation. It's not a zero-sum question. We can protect civil rights, we can protect human rights, and we can protect our national security. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, recognize the young lady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me thank you for the hearing and thank you for the ranking member joining. We have been together on this committee for a very long time and address these issues that are extremely important. I want to take note, uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, because I think it's important that people know what is in your testimony um, as it relates uh, to TSA. And you very openly say we appreciate TSA's role in maintaining safe travel as well as its attention to the ongoing problems discussed in the testimony. So I, I want it to be known that we understand, I think each and every witness members here understand the frontline responsibility of the Transportation Security Administration, as well as the TSO officers, and we offer them our gratitude. But we live in a nation of laws, and we believe we still live in a nation that adheres to the rule of law, uh, and as well our basic principles of human dignity and due process. Uh, and so I think um, this hearing is crucial because uh, it is important um, uh, to get things correct on how we balance the aftermath of 9-11 when the naivete of the United States was breached and we understood that we had the responsibility of security. So I'm gonna ask, um, I think in your report, uh, Mr. Russell, you indicated that a number of these uh, complaints were heavily in about 10 cities, am I correct? On the uh, 3,700 complaints? Right, the, the top three were uh, LAX, JFK, and then Atlanta. Uh, do you attribute that to um, the um, uh, size of the uh, airports and not necessarily that it's not going on all across the nation? That's certainly one factor. I mean, those are the, some of the busiest airports in the, the country. We just provided that data, but we didn't make a judgment uh, beyond that. And so uh, the, the most important point that you want to make out of your um, recommendation is what? So TSA has a number of oversight mechanisms already in place for the remaining parts of uh, behavior detection that it employs, but we think they need to go one step further and make sure there's a specific mechanism within their oversight checklists and their policies to specifically look for instances of, uh, or indications of profiling as they're doing their, their due diligence. So there should be a specific mechanism. Correct. To say it again. So this is, and this is what TSA agreed to, is to go back, look at their, uh, the whole process they use for oversight, actually documenting what the supervisor is observing as the behavior detection is being conducted, and to have a specific place to look for indications of profiling and then to remark whether they're seeing something or not so that you could go back later. So they have to internally do this. They have to set up a structure and do this themselves. Correct. Um, Mr. Singh, let me thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, we will answer your question. We are in the process um, in a committee that works very closely with this committee, Judiciary Committee, to uh, reintroduce the end racial profiling. And uh, I look forward to leading that effort. So thank you very much. I just wanna quickly say, uh, that I'm reminded of an uh, Indian Sikh in, uh, right after 9-11, Mr. Sodi, uh, who was killed in Mesa, Arizona. And the person who killed him was Frank Ruck, I believe. I'm going to go out and shoot some towel heads, and we should kill their children too because they'll grow up to be like their parents. The intensity of that hatred is resurging. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, and put in the record our Hargan Sodi, who's currently a rising junior at the University of Houston. Uh, and he came to my office in Houston from the Silk Lead program, and he is in fact related to Mr. Asodi, which tells us that when we kill, uh, we may kill one, uh, but the spirit 
uh, and the strength of our communities will remain strong. I asked you the question how the community feels and you sort of represent others who may be similarly dressed in other uh, religious uh, garb uh, in terms of what they feel, what, what it means when they go to an airport and expect to be or are treated that way. I'm gonna ask that question because I'm gonna quickly go uh, to Ms. Nelson so that you can ask the question. Um, my constituent, Ms. Mohammed, uh, was treated unfairly in Atlanta, which I'm still pursuing. Uh, and I asked the question uh, to you, um, what is the most key thing that we will need to do? Uh, you said an appeal process, or you said a process uh, that captures uh, where they can apply directly at the airport, which I think is extremely important. So, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, if they could uh, answer those two questions. Mr. Singh, your answer, and then Ms. Nelson. Thank you so very much. First of all, thank you so much for that recognition for um, the legacy of Mr. Sodi. Um, travelers feel humiliated, they feel ashamed, they feel stigmatized, and they feel left out. Uh, in short, they also feel like second-class citizens, and sometimes like model minorities that are not helping their own community. Ms. Nelson. You asked about additional recommendations to improve the process, and uh, in, while the, the GAO report that was released this morning is laudable and it is an insightful assessment, there should be a full audit of TSA practices and policies to determine two things. One, whether they in fact serve national security interests, and two, are they the least discriminatory means of serving those goals? No one group or several groups of citizens who are already marginalized should bear the responsibility of security procedures that are not effective. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if this gentleman from New York will allow me to recognize for a point of personal privilege the other gentleman from New York, Chair would appreciate it. This time, sure. <laughs> uh, I understand you have a special guest in the audience, Mr. Rose, that you might want to introduce to the committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for that, for that honor. I would like to recognize my mother and my aunt um, and my, my wonderful cousin who's out there. Please stand up real, real quickly. Mom and Rachel, stand up. Stand up, say hello. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. Uh, gentlemen, yield back. Yeah, let's strike that from the record, what he just said. All right. Yeah, I'll yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Perhaps Ms. Mr. Gatko. Rose owes me a beer now. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I thank you for having this hearing. It's very important. And I, I agree with the sentiments expressed by both yourself and the ranking member that even one incident uh, of racial profiling is too much. So I commend all of you for being here today. Um, I, I, I must say, though, that um, I'm a little concerned with TSA, and it seems to be a problem that's more endemic to the, the whole administrative uh, executive branch function of our government as a whole. And that is, I, sometimes it seems like they dictate the terms by which they appear here, and that shouldn't be. Um, if they're given 12 days notice or we make inquiries about whether we want to have a witness, either in a majority or uh, us in a minority, uh, 12 days should be sufficient for them to get their internal approvals done. And they signal to us repeatedly that, that they need more time to prepare their witnesses. And uh, if this recalcitrance continues, um, I think we should, uh, we should consider using the subpoena process uh, because TSA should be here to face the fire. TSA is the one we're concerned with and TSA is the only one not here at the table. So in my mind, TSA, uh, we should take a little more aggressive approach in the future if necessary, Mr. Chairman, as I respectfully suggest. Uh, duly noted. Uh, thank you. Plus, I was a prosecutor and I like subpoenas. Okay. <laughs> tends to get people's opinion, tends to get people's uh, um, uh, attention. Now, Mr. Russell, uh, we've, we've talked about this behavior detection, but uh, as the chairman noted in his opening statement, uh, we, we passed a bill out of here, my, one of my bills, that outlawed using behavior detection officers in the, in, in the line to determine which, whether they go to pre-check or not. Um, I want to understand, how exactly are they using these, these officers now? So over the course of our review, they were using them for, in support of passenger screening canine teams, as well as screening of uh, aviation workers. So are they, stationed, uh, are they stationed at the line when people are coming in or, or what? So they would be with the, the actual canine units wherever they're operating. Um, and then 
depending on how the airport is set up to do their screening of workers, they would be uh, positioned there. Is that your understanding as well, Mr. Singh? That's probably SSI. We're not privileged to, so I couldn't comment on that. Okay. Well, I want to get, Mr. Singh, I want to get some examples from you, some more specific examples of, of, of when you think that they've been profiling in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a not an appropriate manner. Give me specific examples, just so I can understand it. In a not appropriate manner? Yeah. Um, so I will highlight one of them. A sick traveler within the past two months flew out of EWR three times, twice from Terminal C and once from Terminal A. When he flew out of Terminal C, in both instances, he was told he cannot do a self-pat-down of his turban. The TSO and the manager said that the rules have changed and that they have to do a pat-down. The third flight of EWR from Terminal A, he was able to do a self-pat-down like usual. He mostly goes through the AIT machine and his turban shows up on alarms nine times out of 10. And this is one of those demonstrations of inconsistent application within just one airport in the last two months. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Nelson, you mentioned some possible remedies for this and could you expand on those a bit? I know you talked about perhaps some sort of a public awareness campaign, but what, are, what else would you suggest we do to, to uh, ameliorate this problem? I'm, I'm really concerned as a chairman knows with the UC's officers, I think it's way too non-scientific. And unless you're engaging the passenger for several minutes and getting a feel for whether there's a concern, I don't think in 10 seconds you can make a snap decision. And I'll give you an example. I would sit for days talking to, to, to people I think committed a murder, and for days I'd be absolutely convinced that they were telling me the truth, and then after a while they broke down and told me they did do it. So you're not gonna find out in 10 seconds whether someone is, is uh, a, a, a security risk or not. So with that as a, a proviso, I wanna hear what you have to say, some suggestions. Sure, so in addition to improving the complaint process and also ensuring that we are in fact meeting our national security interest needs in a way that is least burdensome on American travelers, we also recommend three other measures. Uh, one is that in addition to anti-discrimination training for all TSA personnel, uh, that the TSA quickly implement, as, as uh, Ranking Member Rogers suggested, that it immediately implement the GAO's recommendation, which it has accepted, to monitor compliance with the specific specific procedures intended to prohibit unlawful profiling. So not just general monitoring, but looking at the specific procedures that are intended to deal with this very issue that we're most concerned about. In addition, we would add that in the interest of transparency, it should share the results of that monitoring with the public. Uh, the TSA also, uh, very commendably, it was reported that the TSA requested that vendors last summer uh, provide ideas to improve screening of headwear and hair in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. That is an excellent step in the right direction. We urge the TSA to maintain that demand of vendors and to refuse to contract with vendors using taxpayer funds that cannot ensure that their technology is non-discriminatory. So those are just a few additional ways in addition to uh, uh, phasing out completely the use of behavioral tech, uh, detection techniques. Well, you just gave me a couple ideas for new bills, so thank you very much. And I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Let me assure the gentleman from New York, uh, we will follow up and get TSA here. I'm, I'm wondering why they're not following the congressional mandate uh, of your bill. I mean, I, I don't know how they can... I, I don't understand it either, and that's why I think we, I would respectfully suggest that we have some follow-up on this. Sure. And we uh, if we need to use subpoenas, we need to use subpoenas. Absolutely. Time should, time should never be an excuse for them not to be here. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for having this um, hearing and the ranking member as well. And, uh, you know, I think um, it's kind of already been mentioned, my, um, my line of questioning, um, but, you know, to reiterate, the um, seriousness of the issue, uh, 3,500 complaints in the scope of things may not seem like a, a significant number, but um, 3,500 people that took the time to lodge, lodge a complaint uh, is probably just the tip of the iceberg in terms of people that are not complaining. They're upset or distraught, they didn't like it, but they don't have the time to 
make the complaint or don't know the procedure and what to do next. And that is um, a serious problem. So I'm asking all the witnesses, um, do you suspect the travelers underreport civil rights and civil liberty complaints against TSA? And um, do you think passengers refrain from reporting incidents due to fear of being placed on a watch list that will restrict future travel? Sir? So in our recent report, we really looked at, um, for those 3,700 complaints with civil rights, civil liberties issues, you know, what was the process? So one of the things that you note um, is they don't all really make it to the investigative stage. So um, almost a third of those <coughs> dropped out because there wasn't complete information that the passenger was able to provide to, for TSA to pursue it further. Um, so anything along those lines to, to make it more evident what you need to file, how you um, are responsive to a request for more information to have a complete complaint that can be investigated would be helpful. Okay. Mr. Singh? We believe that there are numerous factors that contribute to underreporting. Um, sometimes the traveling public, especially if they don't travel frequently, may not know their rights are being violated okay. mm -hmm. or that the TSO is not adhering to policies and protocols because those policies and protocols are not always transparent or easy to understand. And I would refer the committee members here to our exhibit B and C to show the difference between TSA's guidance for sick air travel passengers and the one that we developed with close consultation. Thank you. And I'll add that, that we should underscore that of the 300 3,663 complaints related to passenger screening. Uh, TSA's multicultural branch found indications of potential discrimination and unprofessional conduct that involved race and other factors in over 1,000 complaints. Uh, that's a significant number. And that's buttressed by the anecdotal accounts and news reports by African-American women who talk about invasive and humiliating pat-downs at airports. It's buttressed by the accounts of TSOs themselves who talked about racial profiling being pervasive at airports like Logan National Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, Honolulu International Airport. Uh, it is something that we know is far more prevalent than the number of complaints suggest uh, because of the uh, frailties in the complaint process and the very nature of the issue itself where people are under pressure to get where they need to go and do not often circle back. I can confess to not complaining or lodging a formal complaint to TSA when I have personally been subjected to similar pat-downs. Uh, I, I do recall times prior to me becoming a member House of Representatives um, having issues uh, in airports and not necessarily filing a complaint, but finding myself being very discouraged and, and frustrated and embarrassed and, uh, by, um, by the pat-downs that um, TSA formally um, uh, did in their procedures. Uh, you know, uh, what other reasons might uh, result in underreporting of complaints? Well, I think with respect to certain populations, and I uh, particularly would like to lift up uh, uh, Muslim Americans in, on the last day of Ramadan today who uh, often are singled out and concerned that by stepping up and speaking out that they may be subjecting themselves to additional scrutiny and potential danger because of the stereotypes that surround uh, that community and, and many others. Uh, in addition, uh, transgender individuals are often so deeply humiliated by uh, the very uh, binary lens that the TSA scanners and TSOs use to determine um, who is appropriate to pass through security, that filing a complaint and airing those issues only leads to further exposure and potential humiliation. So I think those are deterrents and we need to uh, find a process that allows for a greater opportunity to air those issues. Thank you, and um, I apologize, I yield back. Thank you very much, Chair recognizes Gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Ms. Nelson, uh, I appreciate uh, your perspective on some of the things that you have seen. It's been educating for me, and I appreciate you sharing some of the things, uh, specifically with hair and, and some of the things that the African-American females uh, were fault signals and some of that. I'm going to look more into that and, and check into that. Um, I, did, I haven't thought about this in probably, uh, I guess, maybe 15, 16 years, Mr. Singh. Uh, I remember my third grade son coming home one day with a note um, that he and some friends had made fun of another boy in his class that wore a turban. Um, just thought about that today. Uh, the, the next day, uh, in trying to teach him a lesson, uh, my son left for school uh, wearing a turban that day uh, to try to get him to understand what it feels like to be picked on or discriminated against. And um, I, I do believe that was, uh, haven't always gotten it right, but I think that day we were able to send a, a valuable lesson that that uh, no Americans, and I know my colleagues on this side of the aisle, want to make sure that any kind of discrimination is shut down. At the same time, I want to make sure uh, that there are many wonderful employees at the TSA who take their job very seriously and, and do the best. And uh, I, I think with about two million passengers each day, I think it comes down to less than one one thousandth of one percentage point of some of these uh, actionable claims. Still too many. We want to continue to work on that, but we want to make sure that we stop that. I do have a couple questions. Um, Mr. Russell, uh, as the director here, how does the multicultural branch review whether a screener followed the protocol in instances of alleged violations? So once they have enough information to review the complaint, typically they go back to the airport involved and try to pull the camera footage, interview the uh, transportation security officers involved. And, and try to recreate the events and see if they could substantiate any part of the, the allegation and the complaint. What, uh, can you tell me what, uh, is there a consistent disciplinary actions uh, that are used if a screener does not follow protocol? Right, most often there's refresher training of various sorts, either to the uh, employees at the airport or it could be a nationwide brief, depending on what the uh, issue may be. and. It, over the course of our review, we also noted there were 100 instances where disciplinary action was taken um, in response um, to some of the passenger screening related complaints. I know trends are very important in this line of work. What, what ways does the TSA track potential trends, concerns, that is increases or decreases related to allegations of unlawful profiling? Do you have some kind of system in place that you're able to monitor that? So TSA does, review at a macro level the complaint data to try to look for trends, uh, things that are emerging and has various mechanisms uh, to report that both to the, the leadership within TSA or to make um, the airport officials, the federal security directors, others aware of uh, things that they might be seeing in the data. Can you unpack that a little bit more? You said they have uh, ways to follow the trends. Can you speak to that as far as specifically what uh, are being utilized as tracking the changes to reduce profiling in the future? Right, so one of the examples that we were able to look at had to do with uh, headgear and turbans and the way to uh, handle that situation at the checkpoint when an anomaly is um, uh, present based on the AIT review. Um, religious wear, um, if there are particular uh, religious artifacts that uh, groups may be traveling with, how to handle that situation. So we saw sort of trying to be somewhat proactive into alerting airports to those situations. Okay. Thank you, Director Russell. Thank you, panel. We'll get back to the chairman. Thank you very much. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member I, for holding this most important hearing. Um, Listening to testimony here, and I do wish TSA would have been here, and, and I hope that either this full committee or our subcommittee on TSA does have a hearing and, and invites the TSA officials. It's important to hear from them because they do have an important job, very important job. If we look at, you know, how many flights per day in this country, maybe 2,000 or more, 2 million passengers, um, how many airports around this country, and their job is to make sure that those planes leave and land safely. Now, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Russell, um, immigration, law enforcement, TSA, 
three separate functions. When it comes to immigration, before you walk into the TSA inspection, your credentials are checked, correct? That's right. Many places, before you get on that airplane, you're checked again. Yes, no? Right, to go through screening. So TSA is there really to screen for devices that may cause harm uh, to the passengers, correct? Right. We're always working to make sure that we attain 100% in terms of assuring that those negative things don't get on our planes or get into airports, correct? Right, that is the goal. So I got to figure TSA, those workers have a very stressful job and they know zero tolerance is what's expected of them. So um, what is the policy right now, TSA, when it comes to screening for immigration? Is that part of their job? That's not something that we looked at in this review, so I, I can look in that and see if there's something specific in their standard operating procedures. I can tell you that they and are. And I ask you this because several years ago, we, we, we heard reports that Latino passengers were being targeted by the behavior detection officers in Honolulu, Boston, and Newark. And some of these officers actually called themselves executioners, uh, which meant that they were really looking for secondary screenings that were, would yield uh, drug-related offenses, uh, uh, outstanding warrants, and deportations. Is this part of the TSA mission or goal? Do you know if they're still doing this, or is this something incidental? So that's not something that came up specifically in our review, uh, but in terms of where behavior detection is being used, yeah, we saw that they definitely need to improve the oversight in terms of checking for compliance with profiling, so if, if, the, if behavior detection was involved in the incidents that you are uh, referring to, certainly we think our recommendation will help at least have an oversight mechanism to specifically look for those. Most of us that fly are, are, are familiar with the process, but a person who occasionally flies, travels, so to speak, you're gonna be nervous as you walk up to a lot of those high-tech machines. So you, uh, on the natural, will probably exhibit some kind of nervousness. It, it, the detection behavior folks, would they, would they look at this as triggering a secondary inspection? That's what behavior detection is intended to do, is look for signs of fear, stress, um, using a certain number of indicators. And if you see enough of them, then you refer the person to secondary. How many of these would be false positives, false negatives? Well, that, that's where our work has shown uh, big concerns around the usefulness of those indicators. When we looked at the how many of them had valid support um, for use in an aviation environment. It was only a, a, a few out of the 36 that they currently employ. So it's, it's not really significant in terms of their job. Right. Performance, effectiveness. Uh, I'm running out of time, but my, my, my further thought is, in terms of the reports of um, abuse, reports from citizens. This is a very diverse country, a very multi-ethnic country, uh, a lot of religions. Uh, in, and so to me, every time you go through one of these situations, if you feel that you've been discriminated against, racially profiled, I think most passengers should say, you know what, let me the heck out of here, I just wanna get out of here. And they would not file a complaint. So I'm hoping somehow we get to a process where if a passenger feels that there's something wrong here, I've been wrong, that they can immediately report a, a, a situation as opposed to give me that slip of paper, I've got to go online, I have to write you a letter to, to express my concerns. Any thoughts on that? That's certainly something we saw, you know, about a third of the civil rights, civil liberty complaints that came in uh, did not get further reviewed because they were missing some key piece of information. Someone had to provide. You know, and those are the ones that are actually reported. These are the, the rules that are in place to um, 
to investigate a complaint further at TSA. Mr. Chairman, I would just want to say we need to follow up on this and make sure that there's a robust complaint system so that we get a good picture of what's going on. Aaron. And I want to thank again our TSA officers for the good job they've done. I just want to make sure that they're focusing on the right job. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. And I think just about everyone who's commented uh, uh, understand that TSA is missing in action with this hearing and that they knew well in advance of our intent to have it and that our interest to have them. So uh, we will go forward and have them come and answer some questions. I'm really concerned, Mr. Russell, that, um, you know, we spoke very clearly that there was not enough science behind the behavioral detective the program, BDO program, and somehow, in one hand, they say, okay, we've done away with it. But from what you've said today, they're still using it. In a more limited way, yes, that's correct. Well, that's, and that's what Mr. Katko was talking about, too, because it was his bill. Mr. Chair, I just want, we, we need to follow up on this. I want to make sure if there is a validity uh, to this, this kind of behavior testing use, Let's hear about it. If not, let's move on to something that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, Chair, recognize the lady from Arizona. Ms. Thank you, uh, Ms. Let's go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank all of you for coming today and um, sharing your insight onto this most important issue. I have a couple um, questions. The first one's for Mr. Russell. Um, and from what I read, there's, and what has been testified, there's 1,066 complaints that TSA uh, recommended additional training due to potential discrimination. And then we got testimony from our other witnesses about um, uh, different aspects uh, of possible discrimination. Can you, do you have a breakdown of how many people, how many of these complaints were because of turbans or other headwear or hair? Um, so that I get a better idea of the how many of these this stuff happens. Sure. So of the going back to that larger universe of the 3,700 complaints that dealt with uh, civil mm -hmm. rights or civil liberty issue, passenger screening related complaints, um, about 1,500 of those were related just to general discrimination or profiling concerns. Um, 493 had to do with some aspect of pat downs. Uh, so when you're in the secondary screening process. 279 dealt with hair, um, issues around hair. Um, and just to name a few others, 200 dealt with um, religion. And then another 169 dealt with transgender issues, just to give you a. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, and and Ms. Uh, Nelson, uh, you had, I, I just wanna understand this more. You had said that um, African American women's hair, sometimes they can't detect the difference between contraband and the hair. Is that, is that accurate? And that's after they go through the screening, through the, the x-rays, or, what, what, or the, what it, when does that happen? So the full body scanner okay. does not always accurately detect or screen black women's hair. It can be in an afro, it can be uh, in braids or twists or the locks that I wear on my head. And those scanners cannot properly detect that it is hair and not contraband. So it signals to the TSOs that there should be an additional screening. And that then disproportionately affects black women who have to go through a more invasive hair pat down, whereas if someone had straight hair yeah. or flattened hair, it is less likely to go off. Thank you, thank you. Um, my other, uh, I guess I'm just kind of confused about this behavioral um, screening, the special, specialized behavioral detection training that Mr. Katko apparently, um, I don't know if he got rid of it or not, but it, from what I read, it said that it's integrated now uh, into other TSO's officers and especially those that have canines. Now the airport that I come from, the canines are usually at the front of the line. So how does a canine um, 
uh, officer that is using this specialized behavioral detection, I mean, how do they then say, oh, you need a special pat down? Because normally doesn't the pat down, they take you after you get through, you know, the luggage area, and then the TSO officer there, you know, puts you inside and has you do it pat down. So help me understand this. I don't get it. Yeah, so with the passenger screening canine teams, that could be right around the checkpoint. Think about the, you know, in the queue area, uh, depending on the circumstance. And then the behavior detection officers would support the canine. So as um, you're engaging passengers, you could ask them questions um, and look for some of the, the indicators. If you see a certain number, then you would refer that person for, for later to the secondary screening. So they walk them over to the screening area and hand them over to another TSA, TSO officer, is that what you're saying? That's my understanding. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's what I read is that it, they integrated these be, specialized behavioral detection people into the, the TSAs, uh, TSOs, and they're usually the ones that deal with canines, that's what I read anyway. So I don't know if that was specifically banned in Representative Katko's bill or not. We're gonna have to find out. So thank you very much, all of you. I appreciate the insight. I think that the reason we got to the bill is we couldn't find the science behind being able to look at somebody and tell that they are a terrorist or something like that in a matter of seconds. And because nobody could come back and, and, and clarify the issue, uh, we said, it's, it's not working. But uh, again, we'll have TSA to come here and tell us why, for whatever reason, the intent of Congress to do away with this program has somehow resurfaced somewhere else. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from uh, Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I represent Las Vegas, and so it distresses me to see McCarran on this list of top airports where you have complaints. Uh, we rec welcome visitors from all over the world, and we want their experience from the minute they land or the minute they leave to always be a good one. So I hate to see us here. Uh, but I do think that this chart really only tells us which airports are the busiest. It doesn't really give us much more information than that. And there may be a smaller airport where you have a much higher percentage of incidents of this. One is too many, but uh, you mentioned Honolulu, for example, that you'd heard stories, and, and that's, I don't see that on here. So I think a better chart would give us percentages or break it down by, uh, I, I don't know what, but this, this doesn't really give me too much information. One thing I would ask uh, all of you to maybe address, we've heard you need more technology, you need better training, you also need more accountability. How about more diversity among the TSO staff themselves? If you are coming through an airport and you are a Sikh and there is a Sikh TSO officer, maybe you, there would be some more understanding. Did you look at the TSO, TSA staff to see if they are diverse or there's any attempt to hire diversity, not just train people, but bring all kinds of people into the profession where they can then reflect some of these concerns themselves? So that, that wasn't within the scope of what we looked at for this review. Um, and then just one note on the, the airports. Um, so there were a total of 240 that had at least um, one complaint related to civil rights and civil liberties, but we just listed the top 10. But go back to the fact that even if it's not part of the scope, do you think that would be a, a good thing that, to look into that with uh, divert more diversity of hiring or just at least have some idea of who works on the other side? Yeah, I'd, I'd feel uncomfortable to answer for TSA on that, but you know, it's certainly a diverse and inclusive workforce is always a good thing. Okay, Mr. Singh? We know of some sick TSOs um, in the field. However, without the appropriate input at the leadership level uh, and at the policymaking level, the TSOs, no matter how diverse, are still gonna be implementing problematic procedures and protocols that are not clear and would still unfortunately leave people feeling violated against their own people, maybe at best, mm. right? or just a more diverse face. 
Mm -hmm. I understand about the technology, but I was hoping maybe there'd be some personal connection, but I see your point. I think a diverse and inclusive workforce is always a good thing, and it's something that we should look for in TSA and elsewhere. However, uh, we have found that uh, even African-American TSOs will implement a policy that is discriminatory. It also doesn't account for the technology that itself perpetuates racial profiling and racial bias. So that can't be solved by just diversifying the workforce, although I do think that's an important step, uh, but it will, does not fully solve the issue. Um, anecdotally, uh, you know, there's been some commentary that perhaps people who understand your hair or understand your religious garb better will not in, engage in as invasive or as humiliating a search, but it doesn't eliminate that uh, disproportionate impact of technology and of these practices and policies. Thank you. I know in the report you also talked to some members of TSA and some managers. Did you reach out to their union, ask me, and uh, have any conversations with them? Do you think that would be a good idea? Do you think that could be a vehicle for trying to maybe bring about some of these changes that y'all have suggested that we so desperately need? We looked really at the, the coordination that part of TSA Civil Rights, Civil Liberties um, branch has with community groups and we did note that they have um, a relationship with um, I believe the C coalition and others to have a dialogue on these issues so that that's as far as we went is just to report um, some of that information mr. chairman maybe if we bring TSA in, we could also bring in their union to see how they might be helpful in implementing some of these changes uh, absolutely we look forward to having both Thank you, and I'll yield back. Thank you. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate this hearing. I think this is an important topic. Um, just wanted to, and I'm a new member of Congress, so I'm trying to figure out, can you give me like a, Mr. Russell, can you give me a, a trend of what's transpired here? So it's been, TSA has been around for 18 years since 9-11. I mean, what, you know, it's in their policy, they're not supposed to do profiling. Has that always been in there? Has that, has that changed at some point? And then can you give me some kind of context about the number of complaints about racial profiling? Has that, has that gone up, gone down? I mean, because I think you're giving us a snapshot in time, which is helpful to know where we are, but where have we been? Yeah, a couple of points on that. So um, some prohibition against profiling, I think has been around for a long time. Uh, specifically in 2013, though, the DHS secretary sent a memo uh, to TSA to um, really take a second look at that um, to make sure that they had uh, specific policies in place around uh, profiling and then where feasible to try to collect some information to make sure that wasn't happening. So it got reinforced there. Um, in terms of the complaint data itself, you know, for our review, we looked at uh, the 3,700 the, that are just civil rights, civil liberties related complaints. Um, but just to give you some context, I think in 2017, TSA received a total of about 100,000 uh, complaints in one form or fashion. So 3,700 would be a subset, and that's over you know a little bit more extended period of time, if that's helpful. And so, but, but what was that 10 years ago? I mean, we're, we're, what trend line are we on? Or do you do you know? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, but no, I'm trying I, to I don't have extended data just for civil rights, civil liberties complaints, but I think uh, typically there are uh, half a million to 600,000 comments that come in in a year based on the TSA data we've seen, and then typically it's around 100,000 that are uh, complaints. Okay, and then um, something that's important to me is uh, mothers who are breastfeeding and trying to take milk through TSA. And that is something that's come up in my, uh, in my town halls. Uh, mothers have said, hey, I'm, I show up, I show the piece of paper to TSA, this is how I'm supposed to be screened, and they do it their own way anyway. They take the piece of paper and throw it away. Uh, it's pretty upsetting to me because, I mean, you want to look out for mothers. So that's a piece of legislation I'm working on uh, with committee staff. And so, so yeah, it's important to me. But just going back to that kind of idea of, of showing up and saying, hey, this is your policy, Interesting. Have you had a chance to review TSA's policy and how? I'm not. I see there's something in our uh, briefing about Sheik Palisters, but it's not very helpful to me anyway. But have you reviewed their policy? Is there a specific? Is there written documentation somewhere that people can point to and say, "Hey, this is how you're supposed to"? You know, go back to self-inspection for a turbine, which seems to be the key key question here. 
is there something written? Is there, is there a written policy on that? Or is this just catch as catch can, depending on what terminal you show up at Newark? So it's, um, they have developed a know before you go document. However, it is not accessible on the TSA's website. So I don't quite know how they're distributing and disseminating other than working with community organizations like the SIT Coalition and others, um, which is kind of frustrating because we don't have access to every Sikh in America. Um, and so the guidance is not clear. Their website, uh, TSA's website, doesn't really have any clear policies and procedures of what a religious headwear traveler can expect. And therefore, when they go to present themselves for screening, they're left wondering, what does this process and procedure look like? And really, the onus is on organizations like us and our travelers to know what to generally expect. And there's a lot of deviation and variations as what, what people can expect. It is not exactly clear, and when we try to get clarity from TSA, we are always told that they can't provide any clarity on guidance in terms of pat-downs, the procedures and process, if you're allowed to do a self-pat-down, or if the TSO will do it, because of SSI. Well, it certainly seems reasonable to have clearly written expectations, and that you know helps the workforce, the people that are actually on the ground doing it, to actually do whatever it is we want them to do, rather than leaving them out to not know what they're supposed to do, and then the traveler doesn't know what to do either. Ms. Dolson, do you, do you have any comment on that, on, on, on reviewing? Is there anything you've read as you review TSA's policies that you're concerned about? It seems to me that, that what should be written is correct, but there's just not enough specificity. Yeah, I, I talked about uh, deficiencies in the complaint process, but I, I also think that transparency in what these guidelines and protocols are is key. They could be posted in airports so that every airline passenger knows his or her rights when traveling and knows what can and cannot happen in a security interaction. There are many ways in which we can create much more transparency and accountability in this process, but right now it is, it is cloaked in, in secrecy uh, the Legal Defense Fund has a FOIA request to get some of this information, but it's far from transparent. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to concur with my, my colleague from New York, Mr. Katko. I mean, it's really imperative that TSA come to a hearing like this, and whatever we need to do to get, make them show up, I'm for that. Yeah. And, and, and I, I agree that it's, it's the written guidance, it's the training that goes with it. And, and uh, I was just talking with the ranking member, uh, you know, we have congressional IDs, and every now and then, if you present it at certain airports, they'll ask you if you have a driver's license. So that's, and that pictured ID is in the manual, but it's the training that goes with the written guidance that's so important that could probably alleviate a number of the problems we're, we're talking about here. Uh, we will... Uh, uh, gentleman from Texas, Ms. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member and the witnesses for appearing today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may say so, I concur with what you said about the congressional ID. I happen to have had that experience. And in the interest of full disclosure, I'd like to announce that um, I was a branch president of the NAACP in Houston, Texas for approximately 10 years. Now, further disclosure would require that I indicate that uh, the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP as we know it, they are separate entities, but they have a special kinship and a special relationship. And Ms. Nelson, I'm honored that you're here today to speak on behalf of not only an organization, but on behalf of millions of people, because you make a difference in their lives. And I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about the deployment of the technology. Was there some exigency that required deployment without the necessity to have proper field testing before it was allowed to become a part of the traveling public's experience? And maybe this was the test. Mr. Russell, was this the test or did we test it before deploying? So back in 2014, um, we actually took a look at some of the initial um, AIT deployments in particular, the body scanners. And um, one of the things that- Excuse me, I'll have to interrupt. I'm not sure I understand what took a look at means. Oh, we did, did a report. Did you actually do the field testing? Did you actually have live bodies 
have an experience with the technology before deploying it. We, we looked at what TSA was doing specifically to, to test the technologies. And, and did they test this on live bodies at airports? One of the things that we found was that there were issues. I'm not sure I understand that answer. Did they test it at airports on live bodies? I don't, I don't know for sure if they did that. Well, how did we deploy the technology that is defective there must be protocols that we have to adhere to that would prevent this sort of circumstance from manifesting itself. How do we get here? One of the things from that 2014 review was it was noted that the technology itself um, had a higher incidence of false alarms when it came to uh, transgender uh, wigs, hair type issues. Um, and body mass index. But this is after deployment, is this correct? Right. After it's being used in airports? That's right. Okay, how did we get to this point? Does anybody have some indication as to what was required? What was the protocol that was adhered to to allow it to be deployed? Anyone? Has, ha, have, we, have we bothered to in your various capacities, have you, have you made an inquiry as to what happened? Because I'm just amazed that we deploy this technology. There had to be an exigency or some circumstance that would require deployment without testing it properly. Um, I don't want anyone to be singled out unnecessarily. Uh, this, in this country, we, we value our privacy and we value our ability to associate freely and move about without impediments. So who, how can we find out what happened? Can someone give me some indication, please? Well, I think that's an excellent question, and, and there does need to be some um, historical discovery as to how this technology was acquired and implemented um, in, 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 in view of the discriminatory impact that it is now shown to have. But I, I also think this is an important moment to flag that before any additional technology is used by TSA, and we have grave concerns about the potential use of facial recognition technology, which is already being used in some airports across the country, that we do, we do not repeat the same mistake, that we make sure that we account for the potential discriminatory impact of that technology before we spend millions of dollars implementing and deploying it uh, and at the expense of, of various American travelers, particularly you, people of color. Thank you. Do you all agree that there should be some deployment protocols that we can access to ascertain what the standard uh, is that's being utilized before deployment? Do we all agree? Yes. Anyone differ? Absolutely. I, I will try to, as best as I can, help us achieve this uh, level of... Um, of perfection, and I thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Recognize the lady from Florida, Ms. Demons. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, to our ranking member and to our witnesses for joining us today. This is a very uh, important hearing, uh, and I'm glad to see us having it. Um, if we could just go back to um, Mr. Russell, the questions for you, but. Uh, Ms. Nelson, you talked about um, the need for transparency. Um, for example, uh, airports, TSA, could post information uh, in the various airports, uh, notifying the traveling public uh, regarding complaints. Um, Mr. Russell, if you could please uh, tell me what steps does the TSA take to ensure that passengers are even aware of the complaint process. And I think Mr. Correa from California talked a little bit about this, that many times passengers are just trying to get through the airport. They may have been, their rights may have been violated at the time, but by the time they get through and are home, they've just said, let it go. What, what steps do you take to make sure the traveling public knows that if they feel that laws have been violated as it pertains to their civil liberties, uh, that this is the way that they can make a complaint? The, the main mechanisms that we saw um, was that there's a, a portal, a TSA uh, website where you can mm -hmm. file information. Um, th there are comment cards that can be utilized at the airports. And then airports have what are called customer service representatives that can assist passengers with that process. Um, 
But as a traveler, you would have to, um, you know, have the time to engage with a customer service representative to do something at the airport. So um, for the most part, there's that 180 day window after the incident occurs where you can uh, phone it in or you can file it um, via the website. And they would have to go to the work website to Correct. get that information. That's about right. The, okay. All right. Um, how does the TSA use complaint data and trend analysis to change its policies regarding complaints? So the multicultural branch does analysis of the complaints that come in with respect to civil rights and civil liberties issues, and they can use that to work with the uh, more operational part of uh, TSA, the security operations that's, that's really responsible for uh, the check, checkpoint to inform updates to the standard operating procedures or to uh, send information to particular airports um, where there's been a spike in a, a certain number of incidents or types of complaints. So if a recommendation is made regarding, you know, violation occurs and a recommendation is made regarding additional training, right. I'm sure it has been. Could you talk a little bit about what kind of training has been recommended to TSA that has actually been implemented? Right. It could go to the individual screener involved in a complaint incident and they might need refresher training uh, depending on what the issue was. It could be something that's a, a national shift brief is what they call it, where it's uh, information that's provided to all screeners across the 440 airports on a particular issue. Uh, headgear is one um, that's that's happened in the past. Um, and then sometimes it can be um, just a heads up awareness. Hey, we're seeing a, a particular issue in the complaint data. Here's some information around it, like uh, religious clothing was one uh, that we saw. So if that occurs at a or that recommendation is made at a particular airport, is that information shared with all airports? It depends on the situation. So it can be shared with all airports. Sometimes it's um, dedicated to the particular airport that where the incident occurred. And so back to the question about uh, there are about 10 airports that account for like a third of the right. complaints. And my colleague from Nevada asked the question about, is this just based on passenger volume or would you say these particular airports, there's a lack of train, there's a training deficiency or some other bias that may exist? What, is it just passenger volume or yeah, more than that? Yeah, this is just pure data. When you looked at the 3,700 complaints, where did they happen to occur? And that list was the, the top 10, but, but no association. But how do you get a real, uh, an accurate account of where problems exist? Mm -hmm specifically if you're not looking at percentage of passenger volume and just looking at passenger volume. Right. So, but that's what we had in our report is just that data. Um, my, our understanding is TSA does look for those types of trends, um, but that's all I can say. I mean, TSA would have to answer more on that. And do they generate a report of their, res their conclusions or the results of those? So what we saw was a, a number of the training materials that they developed based on the complaints, and then um, we were able to see some of the complaint trends that they monitored. So for example, there could be a, a range of complaints related to um, handling of baggage or uh, pre-check, um, as well as civil rights and civil liberty type complaints. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Chair, recognize the general lady from New York, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank our ranking member for today's hearing. I thank our expert witnesses for bringing your testimony today. And please excuse the in and out. We have conflicting uh, hearings, but wanted to make sure that I had a conversation with this panel. The TSA screens over 2 million passengers every day, and these passengers are as diverse as America itself. TSA must have policies in place that prevent profiling, ensure each and every passenger is judged solely on their security profile and never based on their race or religion. TSA screenings must rely on science, not prejudice, not bias, and not uh, 
baked algorithms programmed by individuals who harbor either implicit or explicit bias. So having said that, I, my first question is for Ms. Nelson. If screening machines alarm disproportionately on black women, it would follow that black women are also subjected to a disproportionate number of invasive pat downs. How does TSA pat down affect process affect African American passengers given the context and history of policing in, of African Americans? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the disproportionate number of pat downs and uh, secondary screening processes reinforces the stereotype that African Americans and African American women in particular um, are connected with being suspicious individuals uh, or are potentially dangerous. Uh, it is a, a public viewing of that selective process and many accounts by African American women describe being deeply humiliated, being uh, uh, delayed in their travel. Uh, there's an additional burden and cost to them personally and professionally often in traveling and being subjected to these uh, processes and procedures. And again, I underscore that we have yet to receive any indication that this is in fact improving our national security. Building upon that, that answer, the, according to the Department of Justice statistics, African American girls and women 12 and older experience higher rates of rape, sexual assault than white, Asian, Latina girls and women from 1999 to 2010. How might a survivor of sexual assault react to being pat down? Uh, it can be an extraordinarily traumatic experience for anyone who has been a victim of sexual assault or who has the fear of potentially being a victim of sexual assault. Uh, we know from our own studies that African-American girls are often adultified in ways that uh, uh, bring unwarranted scrutiny and criticism uh, and invasive practices to them as they travel and as they just go about their daily lives. And screening machines alarm frequently due to thick hair and hairstyles popular among African-American women and girls, making African-American women more prone to invasive pat-downs. TSA has been trying to be uh, responsive to concerns by African-American women about the pat-down process, but the problem won't fully won't be fully solved until TSA fields better technology. In the meantime, what recommendations do you have for the TSA for improving the pat down process for black hair? Well, first, the TSA should replace the current technology with technology that can accurately screen black hair. It is unacceptable to have technology funded by taxpayer dollars that cannot recognize and discern the hair of the people in its population. So first and foremost, it needs to re remove and revise its technology. Uh, in terms of the ongoing pat-downs, there are ways in which they can be done less invasively. Uh, for example, there can be self-pat-downs, there can be ways in which uh, African-American travelers are able to have have more agency in the process. So there are some uh, near-term improvements, but our longer-term recommendation is that we scrap the technology that, um, that perpetuates racial profiling. Very well. Um, I'm sorry. Mr. Singh, many religious minorities, including Muslim Americans and Sikh Americans, feel they are targeted for random screenings by the TSA. The program is supposed to, gener to operate without regard to ethnicity, color, gender, identity, religion, natural, uh, national origin, sexual orientation, or disability. But how do we ensure that TSA is living up to this promise? Do you have concerns about TSA's use of behavioral uh, detection? We're extremely concerned about the use of behavioral detection. It is technically a junk science and uh, you know, there's no scientific evidence to support that it's effective. Neither has TSA shown any metrics that validate that it is a useful deterrence mechanism. And also, we believe that there needs to be sensible limitations on TSO discretion. It is far-fetched and um, unfettered in terms of any other law enforcement official. They typically have to articulate some kind of standard or basis that warrants the suspicion for a secondary search. TSOs are not subject to such discretion, and that is problematic. As a result, there is many instances of TSOs using their wide discretion for pretextual basis to secondarily screen six Muslims and African Americans and transgender 
individuals. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank our panelists once again. I yield back. Thank you, Chair. I recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Russell, um, is there some kind of process that TSA uh, uses uh, with, when, when they see a name, a name uh, that is a suspicious name? Is there anything in your uh, policies that would direct attention to people based on their name? If there, it would be through the secure flight process, which happens for every uh, traveler, where you would match the name against um, different watch lists um, to uh, determine if someone would need secondary screening based on that process. Well, I was, I was elected to the House in, in 2004, and I could barely make it to Washington each week. Um, and but for a... Um, American Airline, Washington Bureau Chief. Um, I'm not sure I would have even wanted to, to stay. I was, I was stopped every week and harassed because of my last name because I have uh, relatives who are rather famous with that last name. And uh, I'm not one of the famous Cleavers, but there, there are relatives with that name. Um, and I mean, it was a, an awful experience that I went through every single week. Uh, I mean, they take me in the back room and you have to undress, let's go through your hair, uh, let's tickle you. I mean, what, uh, just about anything. And uh, I, I, I was developing a, a resentment that I'm, I've gotten over. And I ran into this uh, American Airline person at a, an event here in Washington about three weeks ago. And she just kind of jokingly in front of some other folks just said, are you still having problems? So I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm still not comfortable, uh, but I have, what, I, what I've done is I, you know, I have TSA, I go through clear everything, trying to, to reduce the fact that somebody sees the name Cleaver and all of a sudden I'm a member of the Black Panthers um, and I'm harassed. I'm not, and I haven't gone through that recently, but I, I don't want anybody else to go through it. What guarantee? I mean, I mean, the, my name didn't match. I mean, the, my name is Emmanuel. My cousin's name is Eldridge. They don't even they don't spell alike. I mean, can you help me? Yeah, I, bet. I have four children. Right. No, from a GAO perspective, I mean, we've taken a look at some of the uh, secure flight programs over the years. Um, there's supposed to be a process to go through redress for these types of situations that uh, Department of Homeland Security um, manages? Well, I, maybe it's because the Homeland Security was only a couple of years old at the time, um, and maybe it's, it's, it's better. Let, uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me ask uh, uh, another question. Um, uh, my, my concern is, you know, you, you, you said that uh, we have information uh, about the complaints. Are the complaints, this is Ms. Nelson or Mr. Singe, are the complaints only at the, uh, the airports that are involved with uh, TSA? Uh, I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Our airport is privately contracted. It's not a part of the, uh, the federal contract with, with TSA. So uh, are there records being kept there as well? I'm not aware of non-federalized complaints. Um, typically, they tend to be for TSA specifically, and I don't know if TSA subcontracts and, you know, those. Two cities, Kansas City and San, San, uh, San Francisco. We can go back and take a look. I would really, really appreciate it because with the passing of each week, I become more and more inclined to try to begin a movement to, to, to uh, uh, force the, the Kansas City system uh, into the federal uh, program. And I, I'm, I'm trying to collect data, and that's one of the things that, that's, that uh, has my attention. Thank you very much. You, you, you can get that uh, to my office, or uh, somebody can. Can somebody get that information to me, please? We'll do what we can to supplement the right. record. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, a report from the National Center for Transition, Transgender Equity without objections. Uh, the members of the committee may have additional questions for the witnesses and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. Without objections, the committee record shall be kept open for 10 days. Hearing no further witness business, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. We'll ask them. Well, are you going to ask them to, yeah. to come? We'll get yeah. them. We'll get them.